Hi everyone. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me. I'm Jen from Actually Died Art by Science. And oh wow, we've actually got uh, quite a few people already in um, uh, the chat. So if you're here lurking, make sure you say hello, um, what you're working on, uh, whether you've heard of a pin loom or a zoom loom uh, is what I'm going to use. Um, and yeah, just, you know, check out the chat, introduce yourself, feel free to talk amongst yourselves. Um, I'm just uh, waiting for uh, people who might be a little bit late to kind of come into the chat. So, um, yeah, I had COVID. So, unfortunately, I was going to do this last weekend and couldn't because <laughs> uh, I had almost no voice. Oh, thank you. Coffee delivery system. <laughs> yes, so it may be four o'clock in the afternoon, but it's never too late for a cup of coffee, especially if it's really good, handmade. Oof. <laughs> this one is a, an Ethiopian, and it's from a cafe. Well, it's from a roaster called Crank House, and it's really, really good. One of the tasting notes is Earl Grey, and I am a bit of a Picard fan, so. He takes his Earl Grey neat. I'm gonna take my coffee neat. <laughs> yes, he he's he's so much more than just a barista now too, because um, his coffee uh, that he roasts at work uh, also is one of the daily um, coffees that I have at home, and um, I think he even said that one of the coffees that he may or may not have roasted ended up going all the way to America to his parents, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Like, you know, I'm sure as a parent watching your kid grow up and then being able to receive a cool, fun gift like that for Christmas must be nice. Um, but yeah, uh, who else do we have? So we've got our usuals. So we've got Crystal, um, Chris and Cheryl, um, Lori, hello. I don't think I've seen you around um, lately. Um, Adele from Norway. It's pretty chilly up there. <laughs> um, got Jackie, Blythe, snowy Iowa, watching from Devon. Okay, yeah, I've actually, I know a lot of people now who live in Devon. Devon seems like a pretty happening place to be. Um, yeah, so like I said, I had COVID. I basically couldn't talk. For those of you who may have had it once before, like last year, the year before, um, it was completely different for me this time. And when I had it the first time, I had been double vaccinated and boosted. And I think I basically went through all the symptoms of a cold in about two to three days. Uh, so I didn't have any particular symptom for very long, but when I had it, it was pretty intense, but then in a few hours it was gone. Uh, this time, <laughs> it was very different. Uh, I basically felt like I had just the flu, like a really bad flu. And uh, the worst symptom I had was just having a swollen throat. So it was swollen, it was sore, I was coughing, and it's only been really since yesterday afternoon where I don't sound like I'm stuffy and um, like I'm talking over my tongue, if that makes sense. So um, unfortunately, having COVID has also delayed a lot of other projects, though, as you might be able to see um, behind me, I've got my uh, Tour de Fleece weaving project set up on my, on my loom. It's my 32 inch Kromsky loom, and I'm using most of the yarns that I spun for Tour de Fleece. Um, so there's like the Gulf Coast Native that I talked about in one of my Fiber Talk episodes, um, and some other bits and bobs that I had, including um, I used a bit of that hand spin that we did in a previous live stream where um, we talked about what happens if you've accidentally overblended a bat, uh, some of the options you might have, and kind of like demonstrating sometimes just going with it or deciding as you're spinning to kind of get a sense of what you should do with it. You know, plans can change and having some of that flexibility is really helpful. Um, and especially if you're like me where it's like, I need to have all of the parameters of what I'm going to do worked out before. <laughs> uh, 
this project also suffered from a lot of that need to control and things didn't turn out right. <laughs> I'll talk about that later. <laughs> so um, I've been doing a lot of filming. I've just not been able to do any of like the voiceovers or like the connecting bits in my videos. And I've also been just too tired to do any video, video editing. So apologies are going to be a little bit of a hiccup um, in terms of getting content out. But that's fine. Um, I'm taking 2023 as and how it comes, which means content will be made. I am very happy to do it, and I will keep doing it, even if nobody ends up watching it except for <laughs> me. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to um, worry too much about trying to be regimented as if I'm like a major broadcasting unit, because it's just me, and I do this in addition to working full time and running a business and. Uh, trying to get things published. So one of the things I'm going to try to do this year is get my PhD published. And if you want to read it, it's on uh, the internet already. So feel free to read it if you're so inclined. And hopefully I will remember and put that in the um, description below somewhere so that if you want to just go and take a look at it, um, then it will be there for you. Easy to find. Um, Chris is asking how my mom is doing. <laughs> my mom is doing much better. So she had a heart attack in, in September, and it kind of cleared her for most of the physical therapy in that period afterwards. And then she sent me another message, like not even a week ago, basically saying that she nearly sliced off the end of her finger, cutting up vegetables for chicken noodle soup. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're just like, <laughs> mom, you're 3,000 miles away. <laughs> Anyway, take a sip of this coffee now, it's a little bit cooler. Now, I did put on my community tab for my YouTube channel um, a little poll to see what people knew about pin looms. So, I think I had one option was like, oh, I love pin loom projects, and um, I put a little thing there for you to describe, you know, what projects you've done. And I've had others who are like, I hate the pin loom. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think there might have been one or two <laughs> who voted for that one. Um, but overall, most people said, what is a pin loom? <laughs> so um, in trying to decide what I was going to do for this uh, live stream today, because I, I did talk about this a few weeks ago when I did a live stream, and uh, there was some interest. So I thought I would do some like really basic stuff and talk about how I use it. Um, and as well as doing like a little demonstration of how I, you know, use it in the most basic sense. There's so much more that you can do with it. Um, so uh, maybe I will design a project that incorporates some of the other patterns that you can do with this little loom. So most of you who are in this chat probably know what a loom is that I'm talking about. So we've got like behind me a rigid head loom. Uh, some of you may have seen um, like floral looms, right? Might have floral looms, so um, they've got a slightly different structure in terms of how the the weaving bits work. Um, if you've watched some of my content before, uh, when I was doing um, the warp weighted loom experiments, that type of loom is prehistoric, so it's been around for millennia and was even used in um, Scandinavia, uh, actually in Norway, uh, up through, there was some knowledge of it, not in terms of like, you know, daily weaving, but you know, people kind of knew how to do it from their childhood, um, all the way into like the 1950s. So, um, Marta Hoffman wrote her PhD thesis, which was kind of like an ethnographic study of that type of loom um, in the 50s, and by then it was pretty much on its way out. So, um, we've got Bronze Age loom weights uh, in Britain, so later Bronze Age, so it's at least around 3,000 years of that type of loom. Um, but the pin loom is something a little bit even more interesting. So I got this as a gift, so I don't really know how expensive it is, but I've been told that for what it, for what it is, <laughs> it might be a bit expensive. Um, so this is 
um, the original pack that mine came in from, I think it was my birthday in 2015. <laughs> uh, and it, I mean, as a box goes, it kind of has held up fairly well. <laughs> and um, it's kind of designed so that you can carry it with you. Kind of like a little mini briefcase. Oh, it's made, I never know how to pronounce it. It's, I always call it Sashet, but I don't think that's actually how you pronounce it. So if anyone wants to enlighten me on how to do that. I don't know if you can really see that. The glare from the light <laughs> is a bit bad. But I'm sure if you looked up Zoom Loom, you might see um, the manufacturer, the brand company for this. Anyway, so inside is uh, the loom and so these are little uh, cedar blocks that I store with a lot of my stuff um, just to ward off pests. You can also do the same thing with lavender. I also like lavender. Uh, Tanya said that uh, her best friend made an adjustable pin loom and uh, she made a blanket from the squares and rectangles. Oh, that's kind of fun. I like the idea of a rectangular pin loom. So this one's square. Um, when I first started getting into hand spinning, so early days of actually died, probably like, I want to say two, 2011, early 2011, I learned about pin looms in general. This is a specifically designed pin loom because the metal tines are sort of spaced in groups of three. So hopefully you can see that. Let me know if um, I need to turn up the sound or anything. But yeah, because it's grouped in bits of threes, it makes for the uh, setup a lot easier. Um, but you don't need anything you know, perfectly manufactured like this. You could just get a sturdy wooden frame, put in some finishing nails, as long as there's not like a wide head on the top of the nail. Um, you know, put them in measured increments. You can do a bigger one for thicker yarn. You can do a smaller one for thinner yarns. You can do various um, sizes, various um, shapes. So the one that I was introduced to back in 2011, I saw a lady doing a pin loom project that was basically making and finishing a triangular shawl instantly. Like, I was so fascinated by that. Um, but it basically follows the same principle. Now, this one I actually did really want because I wanted a way to show off how my yarns looked when I uh, dyed them. Because when you knit them, they kind of go back and forth like this in stocking it, but with weaving, they kind of go in different directions. So I wanted a way to kind of show weavers how my yarns would look if you decided to weave with them. Um, but when I first got it, I wanted to do some practice and I had a load of little leftover bits of yarn. So I'll show you what I have here. Because I used, um, I used a lot. <laughs> to kind of get the hang of this and how different yarns worked. Plus, it's very meditative. Uh, when I first started doing it, it only took me, well, it took me a little bit longer. It took me almost an hour to make a square. Um, but once you kind of get in the rhythm, you can do them about every 20 minutes or so. So this is leftover yarn from a hat. This was commercially spun and dyed. And um, I would say that this is probably the size gauge that this pin loom really works well with. Um, I'd say it's probably in between a fingering and maybe a sport weight earring. Get that to focus. Remember? Yeah. So, um, on the back, I think there's some extra details. What does it say? It's a 4x4, four four, so it's 4 inches by 4 inches. Uh, the total length, uh, you'll need 8 yards to complete one square. 
and then it says weft yarn equals five wraps. So after you get it all set up for the most basic version of weaving on here, you'll need uh, five yards for that. Total length, eight yards. I'm guessing it's, that can't be right, three yards for the I guess maybe it means three yards for the warp and then five yards for the weft specifically. That's really interesting. Truly, I don't mean twelve yards. I've never really paid attention to how much, how much yardage it requires. So maybe I should. <laughs> so um, this one turns out really nice. Uh, it's very balanced. It's got some openings. So if you wanted something that was a piece of fabric that was much more flexible. Then, you know, obviously something that's kind of like a sport weight yarn will, and, and wool will give you um, a nice kind of drape to the fabric. So I've got a bunch like that. Um, I've also got a bunch here with um, blue face luster. I don't know what else I use this for because I don't recognize the yarn in any of my other projects. So I must have made something with the yarn and sold it <laughs> and that's why I can't remember why I only had the small bit <coughs> oh excuse me <coughs> most of my coughing is done um, but occasionally one sinks in there uh sorry so um yeah this is probably um texturally a little bit more fuller feeling because this is my hand spun and so um, yeah you, you might be able to see that it looks almost a bit fuller it's really difficult because you, if you can see the light shining through it like I can the the density is roughly similar between these two but in terms of like the texture, this one feels much more raised. And I think it's because um, I put in a higher amount of twist for this yarn, so this one doesn't have as much of a twist, which, yeah, definitely the case. And um, I think this must have been a, a um, dyed comb top that I spun, because it feels like it's probably worse. So you can see they're very similar. So um, if you're really interested in, you know, kind of mixing and matching different textures in a project, you know, using um, different types of wool and hand spun could be a fun project. Um, but yeah, so this was just me kind of experimenting and allowing myself to just turn my brain off, which, you know, the PhD is a long haul project. Sometimes you just needed to stop. <laughs> um, Tanya says, after the setup, you wrap the yarn five times around the pins of, of the loom. Yes, that, that's right. Um, so I'll show you once we uh, stop talking about the different types of yarns. Um, so I think that was a basic wool. We've got blue face luster. This one here, I must have gone wild with because <laughs> I think this is the Cormo um, that I have um, for another project slated for later this year. And this one, um, I've also used in my mini braid scarf. So Cormo, it's, it's extremely stretchy. Hopefully you can see, it's like a rubber band. <laughs> and I remember when I was weaving with these, uh, it tightened up really, really quickly on the loom. And when I've taken it off, they are just ever so slightly smaller. So if I line this up, kind of like that, you can kind of see how there's that little bit of overlap there. And it's just because uh, the Cormo is, is slightly stretchier wool, so it's going to snap back more than uh, whatever wool that went into this one. So that's, that's also a fun way to use this project is um, the elasticity of different wools um, can be exploited in a, in a project. 
So yeah, I got a bunch of those. <laughs> and then, um, oh, uh, Jennifer Brighty is here. Hi. She says, um, she has a Zoom Loom and really likes using it. And she used a blanket using Aran Weight yarn. And it turned out quite well. See, great idea. Uh, one of the things I do want to do is make a blanket. <laughs> I was initially thinking of placemats, because I'm obsessed with placemats. <laughs> I, I've got a really nice coffee table, and I don't want to get it dirty, and we don't have any other tables, so that's where we eat. <laughs> um, but I think a blanket is probably um, what I would need most. Um, rubber band yarn, <laughs> exactly, right? Um, uh, yes, Debbie, I've been very busy despite being sick. <laughs> Um, some of these I, I, I did a long, long time ago, others I've done more recently. This is the Ryland, so I talked about this in my uh, Fiber Talk series. And Ryland is like such a workhorse, it can be really, really soft. Uh, not quite like merino, but a really decent merino substitute if you want something that has all the hard wearing elements. Um, my mittens that I made with Ryland have lasted like forever, <laughs> like way longer than I thought they would. Um, yeah, so this one is very similar to the Cormo. Um, and then I also have some other commercial blue face luster yarns, like these green ones. Uh, I've turned them into socks, and this was the leftover mitt, but um, yeah, those socks don't exist anymore because they got felted. <laughs> And then this one, which is, I don't know what I used this for, and I left, well, some of these I left ridiculously long tails. I think I was overcompensating, I was doing more wraps than I needed, just because I'm always worried I'm not going to have enough. Um, but this one has a really fun texture too, because it's multiple plies, and I think it's a sport weight, so it's, it's high twist, and so it's got kind of a more dense um, texture to it. Hopefully you can see this. Um, it looks okay on my end, but I'm not exactly sure. And then this one, uh, my partner wanted another scarf, and um, he really liked a pattern that I used for a scarf for me, and it had lace yarn overs and stuff in it. Looks great on them. Um, so this is the yarn that I made for him, which is uh, it's probably like a lace fingering weight, I would say. And so this one also has a really nice drape. And you can, you can use these for a host of different projects. So one of the things that you can do is get a book. So I've got this book here. This was also part of the gift. It's a hundred pin loom um, squares. And within it, there's um, like just basic information about how to um, like wind on the loom and yarns that you can use. So there's helpful diagrams. Um, this uh, three-layer warp thread setup is what I'm going to show you how to do because uh, it's basically the only way I know how to weave <laughs> on this thing. <laughs> Because I, I haven't really needed to use it for anything. Start to weave the weft, you can actually just switch it out for a different colored yarn entirely. So that's a really fun and easy way to incorporate color into uh, this type of loom. There's also a whole host of different um, weaving patterns, and um, they make. I'm trying to make sure that the glare isn't too extreme on the book. But basically, um, there's a host of different um, patterns that you can do, results uh, from weaving this way. So there's, there's a lot of versatility to weaving with a pin loom. Um, I have not really exploited all of these options. I do really want to do a houndstooth check at some point because this is actually, a cap Iron Age people were capable of this type of pattern. Don't know if it was Iron Age people in Britain, per se, 
Um, but this is definitely found in um, prehistory in mainland Europe, uh, up in the north. So um, I think also some of the Hallstatt um, textiles have houndstooth checks. So um, yeah, there, there's lots of really great things in this book for reference, like just showing you the ways you can set it up and, and use it. There's also like, um, like, pro like, cut, like uh, weaving prompts sort of thing, where if you have these different colors, this is kind of like the effect that you can produce, which is really a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I think also in the back, there's um, like a gallery of what other people have done with theirs. Maybe? Well, anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, there's also a lot of different um, projects in here. Who oh, no. knew? Do we have a hiccup? Oh, I'm sorry. It's back to normal. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, we're good. We're good. Yeah, so there's, I think, 10 patterns uh, or project ideas in this book. Cute little dog coat. <laughs> My cats would never wear anything like this, despite them being cold. <laughs> um, but I do remember that after I did a bunch of samples, um, and I revisited this book, because I was a lot more confident in what I was doing, um, there's this throw project, and um, it takes a lot a lot of squares. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten different um, colored squares it wants you to make. So it's something like 200 squares. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Because it's, it's really difficult to see with, with the light glare. But it's basically a diagram of how to lay out all the squares from this project after you've woven them all uh, so that you can connect them together. And there's lots of different ways to connect. I see that um, Jennifer said, or she, cro she crocheted, oh no, Jackie asked Jennifer whether the Aaron blanket she made was sewn or crocheted together. And... Um, she said she crocheted them together using a contrast color, which is actually uh, another design feature. Um, one of the things I've always been a little bit uh, envious with crocheters is using crochet decoratively to combine different things together. So I should probably get better at my crocheting, but anyway, this may be a blanket, but I have a lot of squares left to make, <laughs> like a lot. Uh, I don't actually know how many are here. I've probably got, I don't know, 30 or 40 squares. And I've been slowly accumulating them. So like whenever I've just wanted to make a whole bunch, I've just, you know, I'll like make a whole bunch in the sitting, but then I won't use it for this kind of project for a long time. And I kept going back and forth like, well, I'll just weave up enough for um, some placemats, and I think, well, I don't want to hand wash them. Maybe I should use something else. But I like the flexibility of wool, so I don't want to use cotton and linen. The one time I made linen <laughs> squares. <laughs> There's a reason why they are not included here. Because <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I need to work more with, with um, <laughs> linen in order to, um, you know, make more than one. <laughs> So, um, yeah. Uh, Houndstooth was the second pattern uh, that Crystal did. Um, how does it work on a pin loom? Good question. 
So, as I said at the beginning, this particular loom is designed to have groups of threes. So, based on what the tutorial says, because I've actually not even done this yet, you kind of have a top and a bottom to the loom when you do that particular pattern. And so the way that you wrap them up and then down, you need to stagger them a certain amount so that you can weave that particular pattern the way that it needs to be woven. I don't know how else to say that. I mean, later I might show how to do it after I've practiced it myself because I understand it in principle and I've seen the pictures and understand the pictures, but it's kind of like how the doing aspect, it combines all the things that you've seen and all the things that you've sort of extrapolated from the description and the pictures in combination. So there might be things that I'm just not thinking of. <laughs> but yeah, essentially, um, when you do those types of patterns, you kind of have to keep the loom itself oriented a specific way so that you can keep track of how you need to weave. But with a basic three layer warp, you don't necessarily have to have like one end is up or down because it doesn't really matter. Um, and when I was talking to a colleague in uh, at a conference a couple years ago, I was describing this and she's like, oh, I know, but that's not weaving. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> because you kind of all know that it's weaving, but it technically isn't. And the reason being is when you do a three layer setup, you're using one thread continuously to do the entire square. Now, if you break the thread and you do what's called true weaving, where you go back and forth with a single thread, but it's not connected to the one that formed the warp, then that's weaving. But <laughs> what I'm going to show you in terms of like, you know, this like why specifically we need to have you know excruciating details to our definitions of weaving and not weaving it's for academic reasons and not because i want to say oh well that's not technically weaving <laughs> but it's because when you do the warp you without breaking the yarn wrap it around the, the loom pins and then you use that to weave the weft with this needle <laughs> <laughs> which is mind-boggling, right? Like, <laughs> I understand why we have to be so pedantic about the way we define stuff, but everywhere else seems to call it weaving. So uh, in this book, there's also a little uh, brief history of uh, pin loop weaving, <laughs> uh, which is really fascinating. Uh, basically, it was sort of like something that came to prominence in the 1930s, sort of dipped down during World War II uh, and then kind of had a revival, like some companies had a bit of a revival after uh, that post-World War II period and they were called various things like um, the Weave It Loom, uh, which is what's pictured here, uh, the Magic Loom, Jiffy Looms, Double Weave, Davis Loom, Hollywood. <laughs> Auto weave, simplex, pucky, pookie, <laughs> the tesor. <laughs> Some of these are um, a little strange, uh, but there was also a whole host of patterns to accompany them. So you might even be able to find them vintage. But regardless, there's kind of an interesting like suddenly these were really really popular and then they died off. But I think um, at least with the revival of an interest for knitting and spinning and all that kind of stuff and I mean there's so many more dyers today than there were back when I first launched Exploit Dye. Uh, so I think there's like a real interest in doing these kinds of things so uh, maybe there will be even more projects out there. I know there's someone called um, like Wooly Whimsies or Whimsy Woolies or something on Instagram who does a lot of pin loom projects so if you are interested, I highly encourage you to go to Instagram and find their account. Um, Crystal has also said that uh, some of the books are online free as uh, PDFs. So 
I will also take a look at that because that would be that would be fun for me to look at too because some of the projects in this book don't really suit me personally but I don't feel like that's the end all there's there's definitely got to be more out there um yeah so I think I must have missed something oh Noreen Crone Finlay has written fun books and she has a YouTube channel. I'm guessing that's also somebody who does pin and weaving. So if you if someone wants to post that in the chat somewhere or in the comments, that would be really, really great because I would like to see it as well. My, my coffee's getting a little bit chilly. Okay, so I've got a couple of yarns here. Uh, hopefully, hopefully this is going to work. If not, I've got a blue one. This is a slightly thicker yarn, and I don't think I've used a yarn quite this thick on my loom. Should work just fine. Um, I think it is a worsted yarn. This was something that I dyed ages ago, made a pair of socks with it, and this was the bit left over. So I'm just going to show you how, how to do this by dropping everything. Now on this loom, one of the other convenient things about it, there are some helpful guides. So there's uh, the number, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a number one here, two, three, and four. And if you don't know how to wrap it, a book like this pin loom book that I showed to you and I talked about, can help you sort of orient yourself based on the corner that you're working on. Um, this one also has helpful directional arrows that will take you through where to thread the yarn. Um, and then there's also this little um, clipped bit here where you can stick the yarn and it will hold it while you're weaving. So hopefully you can see that as well. Oh, so Tony is uh, saying that she was introduced to the pin loom and has a dragonfly loom that uh, I'm guessing Noreen designed. It fits in her purse and is fun to use while waiting around. <laughs> yes, more visibility. I love it. <laughs> uh, I have definitely taken this to cafes to work on. Okay, sorry for all of the other talking. I know we are actually going to start now. <laughs> so what I'm going to do here is, uh, you don't really need a large tail, but I usually like to do about that much. And then the first thing I want to do is wrap up. And so because it's already grouped in the way that uh, the most basic weave um, will flow nicely, it's when I first did it, I would always have to refer back to the book to make sure I was doing it correctly. But since it's it's very easy, so you basically go up around two and then down around two and then up around two and then down around two. And you want to work this way the whole way across. So I've gone up around these two, which are already separated out. Then I've gone down, and I skip that first one and do the last two. And then I go all the way up, and I skip the first pin and go around the next two. So you want to basically just go around two at a time the whole way. And um, one of the other notes about this is keeping tension. The first few times I did it, um, my tension was way too loose. And then uh, I overcompensated and it made it way too tight. So I actually had to just undo that and start again. It's not a terrible thing if you don't get the tension quite right. But the way that I kind of set this up is I hold the bit that I've just wrapped with my fingernail and I pull it back down Oops, like that so that there's still a lot of um, give in the yarns, but it's not limp, doesn't look loose. So you just, you just want to 
you know, kind of check before you move on. Though even once you start weaving, it's it's not like the end of the world. And then there's a really helpful arrow that tells me I need to turn and go up this way. So I turn the whole loom. So I've gone here, and I've just turned it. And now I'm going to go around those last two, and then up two, and around two. So this is starting to look a bit... Um, uh, like a grid, looks a bit like a grid pattern. Right, so it looks like a grid. Okay. So if it doesn't look like a grid, go back and see if you've maybe gone around the wrong uh, pins. But once you get the hang of doing this, it's actually not that hard and you don't require a lot of uh, attention. Like I said, when I first got this, I, I used it um, a lot to kind of use as a brain break between, um, what, you know, things that I was reading for my, my thesis. Um, now, this is what you would call a two-layer weaving setup. So some of the patterns that I mentioned, um, the ones that utilize different colors or um, they use the, the warp and weft part of this uh, setup where um, if you wanted to use an extra color, you could, you could just start using it right now uh, and create a different weave structure with that. Uh, so they call this the two layer weave set up. Uh, but what we're going to do is a three layer. So I said we we turned it once, right? Now we're going to turn it again. So we'll have a total of three layers. And on here, there's helpfully another arrow that tells me, okay, I've got to rotate it like this. And then I come up down the middle. So what this is going to do is tighten up that grid a little bit but it's not going to look totally balanced. It's going to look a little bit weird, like I did an extra step. So I'll do a few of these so that you can see what it looks like. So this side should look really dense. This looks like a grid, right? Because you've got, you know, the ones going across and then we have the ones in the back going up and down, right? But now, it's almost like we're covering up that grid by uh, adding a new layer. And when I first did this, it was like magic how, how this worked. So not all pin looms will utilize this structure. And even if you do have a pin loom, this is just one of many setup structures you can have. Um, but this one I found it just produces a basic tabby. So I found this one to be the best for my particular purpose, which was to make uh, a weaving sample to show to weavers um, how this uh, particular yarn might look if you wove with it. So now I've gotten to the end and I have conveniently left myself without any scissors, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I'm here at the bottom. So that's basically the setup is done. But now I want to wrap this five times around the outer pins. So sorry, I'm just reading uh, the chat. Okay, so the uh, other person who does pin them stuff, um, projects, tutorials, it's just under Noreen Conley Finley. And so, um, if anyone uh, wants to put the link to your channel in the, in the description, that'd be great. Otherwise, I'll try to do that uh, when I'm done here. But thank you so much for joining us, uh, Jennifer. It's been very helpful to have you. So, basically, you just want to wrap this yarn around the outer pins like that. So, I've done three or five. So there's five wraps on the outside. 
And then you want to break the yarn, which I always hate doing that. <laughs> and then you've got your long needle. So I think this is about six inches long. Right? So that's kind of for scale. It's basically the size of the loom. And then you want to thread the needle on. It's basically a large tapestry needle. A large? It's very long. It's a very long tapestry needle. And so when you get started, it's going to feel a bit um, loose. And whenever you get started, I always like to hold this, this first yarn or the connecting yarn that goes from the warp to the weft. I always like to just hold that down with my thumb. And then when you're actually looking at it, it's going to be really difficult to show you during the live stream, but this bottom row here, where we come down around those pins, it kind of forms like a little loop. So this is a, a project that forms its own salvages on all sides, which is really convenient. Um, but I'm just going to take the needle and go under, over, under, over the whole way across. And that's how you do a basic weave, is under, over, under, over the whole way across. And one of the other things that I find happens is after I got that first bit of the needle through, I move my, my thumb so that I can hold down the bit that gets looped around the base of the pins just so they stop moving a bunch. And then um, when I get to the other end, you just push it all the way through. And that's basically the first pick of your weaving done. So let's see if we can get that focused. Hopefully you can see that. Right. So you get that through, and like I said, with this type of weaving, you just rotate it. So if you're right-handed, rotate it. <laughs> so now the needle's on the top, and I pull that through, and getting this tension just right to begin is fairly important. So that first uh, warp that becomes the weft, I always like to pull that until it looks just like all the others. So when I first started doing this, this one was always really, really loose uh, or really, really tight. Now, um, when I first get started, you see how those threads are kind of really tightly lined up? It's fine. You can use the tip of the needle to kind of push them out of your way if you need to. I find that it's not as much of a big deal when um, you're getting started or when you after you've uh, made a little headway on your project just those first couple of rows getting started um, it's fine to kind of shift and move things out of the way if you need to and like I said this is a fairly thick yarn I don't think I've used a worsted yarn on this uh, particular loom um, I know it's 100% merino and I don't think it's any of the superwash because um, superwash just it, like texturally it feels a bit different. Um, I don't think um, any of those squares are unwashed, so they're, they've all been washed. I think that's probably up to you whether you want to wash as you go, but as I pointed out with the Ryland and the Cormo even after you remove it from the loom, it's going to have um, much more of a spring back because those wools are a bit more elastic than some of the others I've used. Um, high twist yarns might have more spring um, due to that high twist nature. Um, and so if you're just accumulating a bunch of squares, it might be really helpful to wash them because how they bloom will also impact the final look of a project. So um, you don't necessarily always have to keep labels with everything that you do. Um, I understand that 
a lot of people like to keep labels with stuff just because if they want to get it again or if they want to know what the actual fiber content is or if it's super wash versus not um, like that is obviously important to know but sometimes it just doesn't matter and I feel that way about these little projects even though I could tell you for certain what all of these are the ones that I showed you um, the material properties are what matters more to me and those are the things that I can see and feel um, and a label telling me it's merino well my this this is merino and it feels completely different than this one <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> so um, yeah if you're not one to label everything it's totally fine <laughs> it's okay to not have labels for everything so were there any other questions um, yeah <laughs> crystal said a nice snap <laughs> on that yarn break <laughs> Sometimes you do that and you realize that there's uh, a bit of nylon in there and it doesn't want to break very easily. <laughs> so then it just hurts. Does anyone have any uh, questions uh, or, or need me to clarify anything about the pin loom? I was thinking about doing something slightly more complicated and having the setup be slightly different. Uh, but given that so many people um, were interested in the pin loom, who didn't really know what it was, I thought it probably would be best to just start with uh, a basic project and, and talk a little bit about that rather than try to confuse by doing too much all at once. So you can kind of see how this progress is creating that plain weave tabby fabric. really easy and I think because you can pack these little looms in suitcases or overnight bags or purses it's extremely portable so if you're someone who has a lot of commuting to do if you take the train to and from work um, if you have you know children who do sports and stuff I mean my mom would watch me endlessly for hours figure skating <laughs> But she also brought many sewing projects with her, um, kind of helped pass the time. Um, a lot of my competition dresses were hand beaded by my mother. Because <laughs> that's expensive. <laughs> um, one of these days I'll show some pictures of the costumes that I wore. Um, Crystal has made a suggestion about setting up a short, I mean YouTube short, like a shorts video, of uh, just my hands uh, showing stuff. So that's actually a really good idea. Uh, my channel has now actually been set up to monetize uh, that content, because one of the reasons why um, some creators have kind of held back from shorts is it's it's a lot of work that goes into such a short amount of content and for things that are craft based it can take several hours to do the filming and then you have the editing this is another reason why i'm not on tiktok because just the amount of work that goes into producing that short video content is hard and um I do like to be compensated where I can, so I've just been waiting to um, be monetized for shorts so that it felt like it would be a bit more worth my effort to do that. Um, but I do think because these are so quick to produce, it definitely would be great for um, short video content without any of my yammering, <laughs> which I know there, there are definitely people out there who just want to see and then be on, you know, to the next thing within the next 60 seconds. <laughs> so, great suggestion. Um, something I will look into. Um, I do need to get a different stand because the one that I have isn't great for overhead shots. Um, and I don't really have much in our apartment that would um, facilitate that kind of setup. So, definitely worth looking into. Um, Tanya said uh, she's been inspired to make uh, a second 
the second blanket that she has planned. So that's, that's very exciting. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to have been a helpful enabler. <laughs> um, and I'm sure Jennifer, uh, who was in the chat earlier, would definitely approve. <laughs> I don't think you can have enough blankets, to be honest. Uh, we have one blanket, which you've probably seen in some of my other videos, just randomly as part of the, the backdrop. It's, um, it's the blue one. I picked that up from the... Uh, there's a mill that's located just outside of the castle in Edinburgh. And when I was up there last, which actually was a bit, of, a bit ago, it's the end of... Um, well, it was October of 2019. So... Uh, I I bought it and hand carried it all the way back from Scotland because <laughs> it did not fit in my bag. I was up there for a conference and stayed for an extra couple of days because sometimes when you're an academic, you just take advantage of the fact that you're in a nice location. You stay an extra day or two. Uh, so that's what I did. And um, obviously couldn't resist. Didn't have a nice wool blanket. Now I do. <laughs> Uh, but because it's been so cold here and um, the war in Ukraine is causing a bit of an energy crisis in the UK, the cost of heating your house has skyrocketed and to help keep costs down, uh, you sort of bundle up more. So this, this other weaving project behind me is definitely going to be uh, well placed going forward. Um, and yeah, I think, well, I was looking to uh, make a career change with uh, my current situation. Didn't work out, but uh, I was looking at possibly a two hour commute. And so this would be the perfect project for, you know, just doing to keep busy. Obviously not falling asleep. I have a tendency to fall asleep on moving vehicles. <laughs> Um, can't beat a good blanket. Yeah, that's true. So true. Thank you, Debbie, for encouraging everyone to like this video. <laughs> um, yeah, I've just... Tomorrow basically marks two weeks since I've been sick with COVID. Um, I didn't have the full range of symptoms then, but the sore throat, which I thought was related to my job, because we have this oven and we cook a lot of bacon for bacon sandwiches and stuff, so all of that grease gets superheated in it, and every time you open it, there's this big billow, billowing of like smoky grease that gets expelled into your face, so I was just taking to wearing a mask because um, when I did all of the cooking at my job during that week after Christmas, I got, I felt like I had been inhaling a campfire for a week. It was awful. So um, I thought to save my throat and so that I could continue producing content and things like that, I'll just wear a mask while I'm cooking. But I was getting this sore throat and it was very annoying. And then ah, turns out that um, it was COVID. <laughs> so um, yeah, just, all of those things lining up, uh, not fun, not fun. If you guys have any ideas for the future, um, <laughs> any ideas for the future, that's <laughs> that sounded way different than <laughs> what I meant it to sound. <laughs> um, for the future of my live streams, <laughs> no, for future live streams. So if there's anything you want to see more of, um, I know that I've talked about this when I did the distaff day, which was January 7th. Uh, I have done a bit more spinning with that. It's actually behind me. I probably, well, I'm aiming towards, um, what are you doing? Oh, sorry. I just saw behind my camera what my partner was doing <laughs> with a knife. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I wanted to do a second bobbin of uh, the hemp for 
um, that project I mentioned, I still want to make placemats and I'm going to see if I can get enough yardage to do a hemp and um, flax combo. Um, but we'll have to see how the yarn turns out, especially after I boil it, because the, the flax, when I boiled it, it went kind of from like a soft, mousy blonde to like a silvery gray almost. So I'm curious to see how the hemp responds to that. So um, we might uh, do another uh, distaff hemp spending if you guys are interested in that. Otherwise, um, we could do something else. Someone said eep. Oh, yes, to the knife. <laughs> so um, we've got a little radiator and it needs a fuse. So he was using the knife. Fuse. Yeah, it. I think we took the fuse out of there for our old refrigerator. <laughs> well, you can try it. I don't think it works so though. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the cross chatter, guys. Um. Ooh, Crystal um suggested that maybe the color change in my flax happened because of the pot I was boiling it in. Um. It was stainless steel, and stainless steel, generally speaking, shouldn't cause any issues uh, with color change. Um, I mean, definitely worth experimenting. So the flax really wasn't that expensive. I'm trying to think now how much I spent. It was for 100 grams, and it must have been in the ballpark of like six or eight pounds. So it really wasn't too bad. Um, so yeah, it could be worth experimenting with um, different detergents because I used I used baking soda or sodium bicarbonate and a couple of drops of fairy liquid, which is the probably like identifiable UK name brand for washing up detergent. So I could try that. I guess also I could try um, doing it with just the bicarbonate to see how that result turned out. Um, yeah, that, 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 that'd be kind of interesting. Uh, so if you guys are interested in um, seeing that experiment, let me know. Uh, I would, I'd be happy to run that as an experiment. I've got a lot of experiments uh, lined up for this year as well. So um, once it's, I, I need to buy some furniture to get stuff that's sitting on, currently sitting on the floor put away and to get my studio, well it's a second bedroom, I'm turning it into a studio, <laughs> um, getting that set up. Um, I'm going to resume some warp weighted loom experiments because uh, there's a space over here which you may have seen me uh, do a live stream or two or at least some videos in this little area <laughs> before because uh, it's got some really great lighting uh, and it's kind of like a weird space um, don't really know how to decorate it because it's not very wide it's about, the, it's about as wide as a couch, and that's it. <laughs> you can't get around it on a, I, I, either side, so it's not very big. Um, so I think setting up the loom there for experiments would be great, because I also want to get some of that stuff published. Uh, one of the things I wasn't able to do was put all the experiments that you may have seen little bits and pieces of on my Iron Age textile series hasn't actually been published formally. I've done conference papers where I refer to it, but it's nothing in sort of like a professional peer-reviewed capacity, which I would rather do, uh, and preferably make it available open access so any of you guys who would be interested can still read it, uh, can have access to it. I don't like putting up extra paywalls if I can avoid it. Um, so now I've just finished this particular square and those last few rows you can feel the fabric it's like tightened up a lot you maybe kind of see if I 
push on it. So you can probably see that. So doing those last few rows, you can definitely feel it tightening up. If it's too tight um, and you can't like actually get the needle through and it's you know bending your needle, you've definitely made it too tight. If you can finish the square, you might just say, oh, well, that's a lesson learned, you know, I maybe next time we'll do with a little bit less tension, right? Um, but once you've pulled that last thread through, uh, this is now complete. So you can remove it and you're pretty much done aside from things like um, uh, washing it to allow it to bloom and kind of let the yarn settle. Um, or if you're gonna use it for a project, right? You can wash them all together. So what I do is from the back side, I just kind of push it off kind of evenly like that. Right? Can you stop eating it? Get away. Sorry. I have a tree behind me, <laughs> and my cat is so dumb. <laughs> she likes to eat it, and yeah. she obviously can't eat plastic, so she gets sick. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so I just finished pushing it off. Like that. And then we're done. Ta-da! And so here's the finished result. Uh, it definitely feels much thicker than the other samples that I've shown. It is flexible. It's not quite as flexible feeling as the other ones I've done. So again, this is definitely a case of um, using gauge and texture for your particular project. So if you wanted something that's like a thick, heavy blanket that doesn't have a lot of flexibility, you know, go for a slightly thicker yarn, like a worsted yarn like I've used here. If you want something that is more drapey, something that you could wear kind of like on a cool summer night outside, you know, you might want to go with something that is um, a little bit finer, maybe a sport weight or fingering weight yarn. Um, that'll give you a lot more, um, it'll, ke it'll keep you warm, but it won't keep you too warm, I guess. Um, but then there's also that flexibility change as well. So, I know, right? Cats being cats. <sighs> I have to banish her two doors away from me <laughs> whenever I film because she always just causes chaos. <laughs> um, so, a couple of things uh, came up in the chat. Um, <laughs> Chris T said, Sweeney Todd. <laughs> yes, uh, Sweeney Todd back there with the knife. <laughs> Uh, Brea said, do you wrap around the loom so you know how many yards you need? Um, sort of. I'm sure that if I, uh, wrapped it five times and then measured that length, it would tell me a number. I don't know if it's as convenient to saying three yards, might be a yard and a half, I'm not exactly sure, but according to the back of the loom, it says five wraps around all the pins is enough yarn for you to weave your weft. Um, so that's a really helpful um, measure for this particular loom. But with all of these types of looms, if you've got one that's bigger, if you have one that's rectangular, if you have one that's triangular, um, there's going to be a slightly different method for measuring about how much yardage you will need for your um, weft. Uh, and this is only one way to use the pin loom for um, weaving. So um, I know with triangular shawls uh, on a pin loom that's kind of like this, but obviously it's large and big enough for you to make a shawl to actually wear uh, as, as a single project. Um, I don't know that you have a specific length for the wrapping. 
And I think it's because the way that you set up the loom is very different. It's more like a traditional uh, weave structure where you have the warps and then a separate yarn becomes the weft. So the one that I showed you, the warp and weft is the same continuous yarn. Oh, where did I throw it? Oh, it's right here. <laughs> so this is the start and this is the end of the same yarn. But when you look at it, it looks woven as if these were warps and then I did the wefts separate. So I know I know it's kind of like a weird distinction, but um, I guess it's I guess it's a, it's sufficient to say that there are different ways to wrap on here and this one says five wraps will give you enough weft, but I don't know if the same principle applies to all other pin looms. Because uh, there's lots of different ways that you can use them. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> uh, Chris has also suggested, um, or has asked, can you recommend a water temperature for fleece cleaning that retains more of the lanolin? Uh, basically near boiling. So um, for really, really greasy fleeces like merino or cormo or anything that has like a really, really dense, tight, super fine structure to the, the lock, um, you're going to need um, enough soap and enough water to sufficiently clean it. And there's also lots of different ways you can clean fleeces. So there's the suet style where you basically let the fleece ferment and through that process there's a bunch of bacteria that helps uh, break down the lanolin so that it kind of just falls away from the wool and then after a couple of weeks or so um, you take the fleece out, give a really good rinse and then it's basically as if you had washed it with hot water and soap. Um, but I've never really been in a position to actually do that, um, so I have to use other methods. So if you've got a really, really greasy fleece, like Merino tends to be, what I've done in the past is I use as hot of water that comes out of the tap, and if it's sort of like too, too hot to touch for any length of time, perfect temperature, if it's sort of like, it's really hot, but I could, you know, maybe see myself washing dishes in this temperature, it's probably not hot enough. Um, so in that case, you might boil a couple of kettles, pour that in to raise the temperature more, and then you're still using pretty hot water, maybe 60, 70 degrees Celsius. What is that in Fahrenheit? Like 150 or 100, yeah, about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, should be sufficient to um, fully uh, clean a, a really greasy fleece. Um, and then sometimes it's actually more prudent to do multiple washes or do washes with smaller quantities at a time. So I know it sounds really excessive to do it like this, um, but sometimes that's just how things work out. You just, you need to kind of use certain methods that you know work rather than stress yourself out because you've not cleaned out enough of the lanolin and now it's really sticky and it doesn't spin very well and you're destroying it trying to drum cart it or whatever so um you know basically do what you can to be conscious of what you're using but you know at the same time if this is the method that's going to get your fleas clean and you actually being able to use it, then that's what I would suggest. So if the water is hot, hot, hot out of the tap, you're probably going to be fine. Um, and it might take two to three washes for enough of the lanolin to come out. Um, we're also um, adding in a couple of boiled kettles to raise the temperature more. The other thing that you might consider is uh, how much you're washing versus your volume in your wash basin. So um, when I have washed really, really greasy fleeces, one of the things that I try to do is think about sort of like the top quarter as where the fleece is sitting. And then that space below is where all the junk is falling. <laughs> 
Uh, so you want to have sufficient room on that top like quarter or so of your basin be where the fleece sits. So you want to have um, some room for the fleece to kind of move around freely and not be too cramped. Um, and room for all of the stuff to fall because it's not going to fall completely out of suspension. So you're going to have the big particles that sit at the bottom. They fall down there immediately. Done. Easy. But then you also have like those really, really fine dirt particles that kind of want to float in the middle. That's why I always like to have a much wider um, bit between the bottom of my basin and uh, where the bottom of my fleece is sitting so that I am more efficient at cleaning so that I'm not constantly trying to wash out all of this dirt and then I go to use it and it's still really dirty. Um, and the same thing applies to the lanolin. You just want more water to help get it away from your fleece. Um, so that's just what I've sort of figured out from experience. I don't know if this is, you know, 100% accurate, but, uh, you know, experience counts for something. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> cool or cold water wash on your fleece. Um, I know I've mentioned this before in other videos. I've got uh, some videos where I talk about washing fleeces. And one of the things that um, I have chosen to do with certain types of fleeces is if it doesn't have a ton of lanolin, if you could put it in water and you can submerge it without a lot of uh, resistance from the lanolin, then you could do what I like to call a cold soak. So you put it in, the water kind of like helps loosen up all of the dirt and extra stuff that we don't want, like, you know, vegetable matter and whatever. That can fall out and you can let it sit for as long as you can tolerate really. So if, when I've done it in the past, I've done it in a bathtub, so I'm limited. <laughs> I can do it overnight. Um, but if you have like big totes, you could put it in a big tote. Put the lid over it, let it sit for a couple of days just in that cold water, gently lift the fleece out, dump out that water, and then you can proceed to wash. Um, if it doesn't have a ton of lanolin, you might actually just use it as is. Uh, there are some wools out there that are really great for it. Um, if you have something like alpaca, I usually do that cold soak method. Um, and I know it sounds crazy, but when you're doing cold soak, it's you're less likely to risk felting. And what I like to do with alpaca is I'll put it in the cold water, get it all spread out, and then once it's submerged, I'll kind of like just give it a shake like this on, on top. And it's kind of like taking your hair and doing this, <laughs> but I'm doing that to the alpaca. And what I found um, with that method is I'm not risking felting and I'm loosening up a lot of the dirt that tends to get stuck in alpaca fleeces um, and so I'm spending less time washing it and I find that there isn't a lot of dust in the alpaca when I go to card and spin it so uh, the color looks a lot better when I dye it as well so there's lots of reasons to do it that way um, so, you know, in some respects, it is con like doing a cold wash is also contingent on your fleece. Um, I suppose you could probably also cold wash a merino fleece uh, to a certain extent, although because the lanolin is so extreme on a fleece like that, it might actually become a barrier. So that's a another thing to consider. Um, cat, you were banished. Yeah, right. <laughs> What would the experts call this type of weaving? Um, I don't really know. Uh, continuous versus discontinuous weaving, maybe? Because I would think, like, continuous weaving, because you're taking the same yarn and forming the warp and also the weft with it, it's continuous. And most weaving, the way that we define it in textile studies, especially in prehistory, tends to be discontinuous. You have warps 
that are distinctly cut and separate from the weft. So that might be a way you could define it. Um, gosh, what else? Mm, looping? No, not looping. It is still weaving, though. That's a really good question. I'd have to look a little bit more because this sort of loom wouldn't come up in my area of study. <laughs> and I don't usually talk to scholars who who study more recent fabrics, so I don't really know. It's <laughs> a good question. <laughs> Such a good question. <laughs> um, so Chris says that she has cleaned fleece um, by just letting it sit and letting it ferment on itself using rainwater. Um, Uh, sometimes I feel I have taken the life out of the fleece and so maybe the water was too hot. Um, it's, it's probably also too long. Um, so you could, you could do an experiment because I have never, I have actively tried to not overwash my fleeces. Um, I had one bad experience and that's really all it takes. It gets really dry, really brittle. Um, it, it, it's like, why did I spend my money on this? I've just ruined it. <laughs> Luckily it wasn't very expensive and I didn't buy a full fleece so it was fine to experiment with. But then I learned that you can't remove too much lanolin just because it, it does, it feels lifeless, it's brittle, it's like frizzy. Um, I use a lot of argan oil in my hair so that it's not like, you know, big. <laughs> it looks tame. <laughs> and so that it's soft and not as brittle. So uh, I oil my hair all the time, every day, multiple times a day. And I try not to fuss with it too much. And I don't use like rubber bands because it kind of pulls on the hair and it makes it really brittle. So, um,. I had a problem with this when I was younger, growing up, not really knowing how to take care of my hair, and even in my earlier adult years, just using a whole range of products that purport to do something, but they don't. <laughs> um, if anyone has watched, like, daily vlog episode, like, number four, <laughs> we'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yes, experiment with how you wash. Uh, Crystal says, you can try a soak in cool water before doing the actual soap and water wash. Yeah, that, that is also another thing um, that I have suggested before too. If you want to get an idea of how much washing might be entailed, do samples. So um, before I wash my merino fleeces, I always take like a small sample, maybe a bit that I'm not like as in love with. So, you know, not as soft or the, the lock structure is a bit loose or, um, it, it's a bit cotted, so you know maybe the fleece was uh, covered. Um, so you know it's a good bit to experiment with, and you use a, a smaller wash basin as comparison. So you might use your sink, and you use a, an appropriate amount of soap for the sample size, and experiment with your water temperature, your soap amount, how long you're sitting it for, and then. Once you've gone through the initial wash, uh, dry a bit of it and, and kind of feel it, because you can actually feel if it's still got that waxy substance, the lanolin on there, it will feel a bit sticky still. Do another wash, and if it sort of feels kind of like wet hair, you've probably done enough. And then do a rinse, let it dry, and then you can kind of vary from that sample to kind of see how much, how little, time, etc. you might need to wash that particular fleece. And then of course, if you do smaller batches at a time, you can kind of fine tune that so that you um, don't ruin a batch, so to speak. Um, so Chris has said uh, she's bought bats from me that feel like more lanolin than she ends up with. Uh, and she's starting to really notice the difference. Yeah, um, that is one of the, the issues that I encountered when I first started was uh, what role does lanolin really play in the whole, you know, processing, spinning, and even knitting and weaving um, that, that might come after. 
so um, what is what role does this linoleum play? And um, I always err on having slightly more linoleum because you can always take a bit more out. And some of my fleeces, I know I've I've done a bit too much on that, but as long as it's mostly clean, it's not like a big deal. Um, but I have a Suffolk fleece, and this is Suffolk uh, Shropshire. So it's a Shropshire fleece, and um, that one is um, a little bit tacky now. And I washed it probably in 2017. So that lanolin that I left on there was a bit too much, so now it's starting to harden. Um, but as soon as I put it in hot soapy water, it's going to soften again. And um, because I knew I was going to dye it, when I go to dye it next, uh, one of the things I'll do is make sure that I add extra soap, let it do a, a nice soak before I start to dye it so that I'm getting rid of that extra lanolin. Because lanolin will also be a resist in the dyeing process. So, um, it's not like 100% total, it's not like a full resist, but it can cause colors to not be as consistent in a batch, and it can cause um, streaking, things like that, so I guess it's also inconsistent. But, um, yeah, so if you, if you find that you've overdone it, what you can do is take a, an oil like sweet almond oil or pumpkin seed oil, and um, while you're working with the wool, you can kind of like use a little bit of oil on your fingertips and kind of like blend it into the wool. That will help, um, kind of like in a rehabilitation type way. So you're adding more oil into it. So I have some um, sheepskins. I'm actually sitting on one. And what I like to do every once in a while is I'll give it a brush, right? <laughs> and then I'll take some oil on my hands with some lavender mixed in and then I'll just rub the whole fleece down and comb it, comb that oil through and it helps preserve the soft texture it makes it uh, more water resistant um, and it helps keep the leather part of it in good condition for longer so that your um, sheepskins can last longer uh, so those are the things that I do when I feel like um, something is a bit dry, but it doesn't happen that often. I normally do that just for the sheepskin, but that's something that you could use. Um, olive oil is also another option if you want to go more on the cheaper side. Um, let's see here. What else? Um, like a combing milk. Yeah, you could say something like that. So, um, about once a year, I like to actually just wash the sheepskins. Um, and you have to do it obviously when the weather's gonna be good so that they dry fairly quickly, but not too quickly because you can dry out the leather. Um, but I do this, and I've had these, gosh, since 2015, and they, they still look great, I'll show you. So this is my merino. And it's very soft and very pliable. It's very nice to sit on. <laughs> and importantly, it keeps the cat's claws <laughs> off of this. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't feel like you totally ruin something if you overwash something. But sampling is always really useful, and once you're used to washing that particular type of breed, then you know what to do for the next time, more or less. Um, it's fine to err on the more cautious side, because you can always, you know, after it's dry, totally dry, you just wash again. <laughs> you know, yeah, it takes time, and a bit annoying, but, it, you know, it's just, at the end of the day, you want a product that you um, enjoy working with and you're happy working with nothing that's going to give you like frustrations or not going to turn out the way that you want and i don't want anyone to be disappointed um so you know there's like you know some some ideas to uh consider during your next uh, adventures but yes lanolin is very important 
to how um, how wool feels and um, yeah just don't be afraid to add more oils back if you've accidentally stripped too much out even if it's something that you've already carted into a bat because during the spinning process you can add more oils um, so we've got Debbie here who says she makes a combing milk um, and keeps it in a spray bottle allowing her to kind of like spray her hands before she spins this is kind of like how um, in the past when I talked about spinning silk like silk hankies any kind of imperfections on your skin you immediately notice <laughs> so um, in those kinds of cases having some like body butter or lotion or some kind of oil with you to kind of help smooth out those bits of your skin so that when you're spinning it it doesn't get caught on you and you make a nice smooth silk yarn <laughs> you can do the same thing with, with wool um, Yeah, so if you've noticed the difference, um, that's probably uh, a good thing because I didn't notice it until I had this one experience. So, um, yeah, lanolin lanolin's very important and apparently, as according to Crystal, very good for nail growth. <laughs> Soft hands and great nails. <laughs> it's also nice, especially when I have to wash dishes all the time at work. Um, yeah, so I was going to do another square, but I am also conscious that we've been going for about an hour and a half. Do you want me to show you again uh, how to do this with maybe this color? Or should we um, think about a, another topic for next time? I won't be able to do next week. Um, we are hopefully having our campaign finale for my D&D &D, um, uh, campaign that's been going on for <laughs> just over, oh, uh, let's see here, yeah, like five and a half years. <laughs> so I'm going to be doing that instead, uh, I even asked for some time off to do it. Yeah, this blue, this is what happens when you get caught in a particular mode and you're just doing the same thing over and over and over and then suddenly you want to do something completely d different with your dyeing and then you don't follow basic rules. <laughs> so this was supposed to be a semi-solid in this lovely teal and I set everything up as if I was going to do my hand paints which is a completely different philosophy when it comes to setting everything up and when I did this I was like oh my god I'm so dumb. <laughs> So I wanted to make some socks for my mom anyway, so I was like, well, I'll just use this yarn. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is, this is what I do with needles. Don't do this because um, you won't know where you've put your needles <laughs> if you do this to your yarn. <laughs> Rules are meant to be uh, broken. Um, the blue should almost plaid. Yes, it will plaid. Uh, so I don't have them with me, but I was planning to do a quick video of those socks because it was basically the first uh, knitting project that I did for my New Year's resolution. Um, and then I have to send them to my mom because they are technically her Christmas present. <laughs> um, but what happened was really curious and probably serendipitous because it was totally not planned. and. In all likelihood, I should not have done this, but the way that I had this sitting in the dye pan when I was dyeing it, and how I put down the dye, it kind of made the color pooling pattern really beautiful. So it kind of like spirals up the leg, like the foot and the leg of the, of the sock, on both of them, and it is almost identical. <laughs> I didn't even, I, like, I don't know how I managed to pull it off, but they look really nice. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, with, with color pooling and knitting, sometimes you'll start off your pattern or whatever, and it 
and it looks okay, and then suddenly you get like this weird zone where it's just like, oh no, the color is lining up very poorly. <laughs> and it looks weird, and I don't know, should I just use this yarn for a different project? Should I try a different construction method? <laughs> so sometimes, yeah, I think probably what happens more often is, you know, in a pattern like that, when the color starts pooling strangely, it doesn't look very nice. But sometimes accidents are happy and this produced like a beautiful pair of socks. So I'll have to show you. Um, but yeah, with, with this, it will definitely produce a, um, a plaid effect on, on this little zoom. I actually, I, I have a whole bunch of um, these samples on my website because, again, one of the reasons why I wanted this loom was to show off how uh, my hand dyed yarns looked when you wove with them, so you will get kind of like a, a plaid effect. Let's see if I can just set this up really briefly. Uh, I feel like my <clears throat> COVID symptoms are still with me. I'm a little bit stuffy now from all of the talking I've done. But, um, yeah, there's still quite a few of you watching. Thank you so much for watching the stream. It's very helpful. Um, and if you are interested in anything that I have yammered on about, please consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already. And um, checking out my shops, where I've got a whole range of, uh, like, bats and top and yarn. We even got some undyed stuff, so if you want to practice dyeing yourself, that is also available. I know I'm, I'm being very inconsistent with updating all of my platforms, but I've just... If you watched my New Year's resolution video that, that came out most recently, you'll know that 2022 was awful, and I started off... <laughs> Sorry about that. He did not get COVID, which is great, but he got sick with the common cold at the same time, so we're both feeling really awful. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I've, I've started 2023 with such high hopes and, you know, having COVID for two of those weeks already. It's been um, kind of difficult just smiling and nodding and carrying on, but uh, there are things here that I need to... Uh, add to the shop, well, both shops, Etsy and, and actuallydye.com, and also to um, make sure that my two inventories are the same. It's one of the challenges because I, I find that Etsy is really great for driving traffic to me on a regular basis, but a lot of you who um, like know the difference between uh, buying something on someone's Etsy versus buying on someone's website, it's, it's, more, it's generally speaking more supportive to the individual creator if you buy from their website rather than Etsy. Um, so there are people out there who have purchased from my website instead of my Etsy, uh, which I deeply appreciate. Um, but it can probably be very frustrating if you want to support me and I have something listed on Etsy that isn't on my website. <laughs> so apologies for that. And if you do find any kind of error like that, please let me know. And I will fix it as soon as I can so that, um, you know, you can support me in the way that suits you. Um, and I also uh, will be posting a couple of interesting things to my Patreon coming up here. Because... Um, the people who support me on Patreon um, are really helping me in kind of like that general sense. So even when I've not been very well, and the content that I put out is sort of like oh, I tried, to, I, you know, I try my best, and it's sometimes reality and life happen, and it's just not going to work out. Um, so Patreon is a really great way for creators to be supported more regularly, and I am for sure that my content is getting to the people, um, you know, immediately, right? So with the YouTube algorithm, sometimes it's hit or miss. So, um, 
one of the, the issues I've had uh, with 2022 is feeling anxiety about not being able to post regularly or, you know, having difficulty managing all of the things I have to do while, you know, YouTube is basically saying, hey, if you want to do better, put more content out. And it's like, well, I would love to, but I just can't. Yeah, this is definitely going to plaid based on how it looks at the moment. And let me go say two, three, four, five. Okay. Do another yarn snap here. <laughs> Where do we need to go? So, there. You might be able to see the, the sort of wider bits here, right? And there's like some of the darker bits of the yarn here. So it's going to form kind of like a natural plaid um, as, I, as I weave with it. And again, I'm just doing this really, really basic um, three layer setup where the warp and weft are identical. So it's all the same thread woven through. And away we go. Oh dear. So I know I can't do next weekend. Does anyone have any other ideas? Wait a minute, what have I done here? I don't know. I got busy talking and I uh, lost track of what I was doing. <laughs> uh oh. Okay, so that's correct. Oh my god, you guys, I did it. I did another. <laughs> I did too many wraps. I did four layers. I was, I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna start. Just to make sure. Okay. No, nope, no, nope, that's correct. Yeah, okay. No. Well, I just did an extra layer, like uh, you know, I was busy talking and not paying attention. <laughs> Have I heard of a painted warp? Um like you make up a warp out of white yarn and then you dye it and then you put that warp after you've dyed it straight onto a loom. Is that what you're talking about? Because I've seen people do that and that was actually a, um, it's, it's got uh, roots like in Japanese kimono making, you will have um, a painted warp where part of the design is made because the warps have been dyed a specific pattern. Yeah, oh my gosh, I'm so silly. I literally wrapped it one more time than I needed to. So this one's gonna have a very long weft when I'm done, but that's okay. Because so I have another project that uses up these tiny little bits of yarn. So whenever you're weaving in the ends of your knitting or whatever, and you have a piece about that long, you can actually keep all of those and you have a couple of options. One of which is if you use those in a latch hook, all you need is a latch hook fabric and a, a latch hook or even a crochet hook. Um, and you just fold them over and you make little loops to uh, create kind of like a little rug or something decorative, like a textile you put on a wall or something. Um, but I have a project that is using tons of the little extra leftover bits, 
you know, even from weaving on a loom, you can usually get a few uh, pieces per warp yarn. Um, so that's really great for that kind of project. But also, if you um, save those bits, you can actually card them with like little hand cards or dog brushes and reuse them as little texture bits in making bats uh, or Rolex. <laughs> oh my goodness, I can't believe I did that. Of course, I got, I got so focused on yammering about stuff. <laughs> um, she's thinking about how to paint a short warp for a rigid head of loom, but I think adult supervision is advisable. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not referring to me as an adult. <laughs> I think I'm anything but... Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, so there's lots of ways you can go about it. You can... Um, I think it's uh, alginate that you can use. Uh, it sort of thickens dyes. So if you make like a concentration of dye and water, you can use a thickener so that it's kind of almost like um, uh, like acrylic paint. So it kind of feels a bit viscous. And you can literally paint your dye straight onto your warp. And then uh, you don't have to worry about uh, assuming that your warp is wetted but not like dripping wet, you can literally take paint brushes in your dye, paint on the dye where you want it, and then you can steam set it. Um, so if you've got like a little steamer thing uh, for your clothing, you can. I'm pretty sure you can steam set with that kind of tool. And in that case, you don't have to worry about uh, the colors running or um, if you don't have something like that, you can always wrap it up in cling film, right? So you, you just, to keep it as flat as possible, you want to make sure that the, the way that you fold it up, once you've added the dye, that a later bit of, bit of the yarn in your warp isn't touching an earlier bit. So if you think about it as sort of like a sheet of paper, you don't want to fold that sheet of paper back over on itself because right, you'll get that dye transfer. So if you've got like a big table, you can get your warp all set out, right? Do all of the color painting that you want to do with the dyes and then carefully cover it up and then wrap or roll that up into like a little um, jelly roll and then you place that into a basket to be steamed, which is actually what I used to do uh, way back when, but I've upgraded all my gear because I've been trying to get away from single-use plastics and anything that can't be reused. So um, I don't do hand paints that way anymore. I can, but I don't like using plastic like that. But if you're doing it for like a single project or just, you know, personal use, you know, I won't, I won't say that like, yeah, I encourage you, but at the same time, there's really not a lot of options I can think of to do this that doesn't require a lot of outdoor space and like, kind of like a studio setup. Um, but you know, if you, if you know of another way of doing that exact same thing without having to use single use plastics and great, <laughs> which is probably why some people use the um, clothing steamers to uh, achieve that result. A water, yeah, a water thickener. I think it's alginate that um, some dyers use. I managed to get a knot in this yarn. I'm having all kinds of difficulties. <laughs> a shower curtain. Oh yeah, a shower curtain. That could that could work as long as it's flexible. Um, or even um, if you have those little. Um, like party table cover things that would also work uh, for that in which case um, you know you could reuse it pretty much until it fell apart so that's definitely a, a good option um, but yeah uh, before you embark on a project like that, definitely have all of the 
the stuff set up ready to go like you might not really want to have one brush for all of the colors you want to use uh, you know marking things out with tape measure or you know having the the general color pattern that you want just marked out on plastic or you know even a, even if you put like a paper underneath just so like you could see through um, some kind of reusable um, plastic maybe maybe you could use silk gum um, but yeah you would want um, pretty much everything to be set up ready to go before you did it just because one I know that once you start dyeing something delicate like that that requires you to have like focus and control over your actions while you're dying it can be very stressful if anything starts to go wrong so um, definitely you know plan uh, really really well uh, in advance so that when you're doing it you can just do it <laughs> um, alginate I think it's it looks like um, I think it's A L G I N A T E alginate alternate 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 maybe um, yeah some yeah something along those lines would be really good yeah if you're not very good at plaid definitely use a hand dyed yarn that has um, a pretty frequent repeat or something that has lots of different colors because I, I really think that um, the high contrast yarns that I've made um, and I guess this one included because it goes from really dark teal to kind of like almost white it will naturally form a plaid and obviously you can have plaids that have different colors so they don't always have to be high contrast but I think the high contrast ones are really visible Um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right, alginate. <laughs> now, I've never done dyeing this way, but, um, if you're anything like me, you get really excited, enthusiastic about various projects you could do, <laughs> and you spend forever kind of researching and learning how to do them, and then you just never get around to doing it. <laughs> So I've seen loads of tutorials and pictures and projects that other people have done with this. And I've also seen a lot of ethnographies, uh, people who go out and try to record people doing these ancient crafts that are threatened with um, obsolescence. Um, so I've seen how it's been done in tra like traditionally in societies. Um, the ones that basically predate uh, indus industrial methods so everything had to be done by hand and this is how they did it type thing so I definitely have a lot of theory but I don't have a lot of experience so you'll have to share your results when you get around to doing it Yes, <laughs> Crystal, <laughs> you're like my spirit animal. <laughs> she said, that's pretty much me when I was talking about um, like getting really, really enthusiastic and, and reading up and learning about all this cool stuff that you could do. And then <laughs> maybe not having the time to do it, <laughs> wanting to have all the time to do it, but not actually having the time. It's always a pain. Um, what else? I know another uh, project that we've talked about was wool spinning with a distaff because the one that I have for my hemp, it's a medieval style, so it's actually really, really big. And the person who made it is a reenactor. I'm pretty sure they still have a shop. I haven't checked lately. Um, but it's, uh, you can take it apart. And I, I, I know that Chris has suggested um, trying to put the distaff that I have, like the topper that I have, on my Kromsky 
a spinning wheel behind me, which you can sort of see the top of it right there. So there's this, it's part, yeah, it's sort of like a part that's covered, uh, but you take that part off and you could put something down on top of it. And so the reason why I got the Kromsky Minstrel Wheel is so um, I could have flexibility. So it's a double treadle, what I prefer. And it's a double drive set up also for scotch tension if you want. There's the bulky flyer attachment and there's um, a flax distaff that you can get as, as an add-on. Um, so it's a very versatile wheel and um, it's beautiful. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just haven't gotten around to trying it because I need to spin what's on the distaff first. I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make an experiment with that idea. Um, but I could certainly do, like after I spun this bit, I could definitely do uh, a wool, um, a wool distaff spinning episode. Because I've seen a lot of people um, spinning wool with distaffs lately, and so I'm very inspired to do that. Oh yeah, Chris, I haven't tried it yet. Because <laughs> I need to have it clear before I um, see if it works because uh, the hemp is sort of over the joint and I don't want to mess up what I've already processed to put on the distaff so far so I just need to spin it it might work they're very I know from you know recalling putting it together when I first got it that um, <clears throat> Uh, approximately how big that that component is but I don't know if it will actually fit on top so we'll have to see um, yeah so we could do that topic or if you have like anything you're working on and you want to just see how I do something uh, maybe I've got a video but I don't have a the right angle or if you want to you know just see me do something so you can ask questions in real time well, that's also fine because um, otherwise I might just kind of do a live stream based around whatever project I need to get done <laughs> which it could it could be actually just leaving uh, with my my loom here um, you know, two birds, one stone. I know that um, I'm still kind of a beginner when it comes to weaving with this. Uh, don't know much about like setting up for twills, and I, I mean I know how to do it, but I don't usually end up doing it. Cause it's very complicated. Um, but it might be worth just talking about working with uh, different wool breeds because this is. Um, several different types of wool breeds <laughs> in the same project and that can cause issues when it comes to tensioning and getting uh, the right sort of beat. They're all roughly the same gauge yarn but some of them are a little thicker than others. Um, they are all wool so there isn't any silk in this one. Um, my next daily vlog I'll be talking about what it was like just weaving both silk and wool in the warp. <laughs> it's, it was a challenge <laughs> and very slow going, but I managed. And I was crazy and I did that project for a uh, tour de fleece. Cause I was, I was spinning every day and I was also recording, editing and uploading a video every day. And I thought I'll just start weaving a project too. <laughs> So, yeah, it took me a while to finish that project. But it took me no time as soon as I got the stand. So I'm almost done, and you can really start to see how this is um, coming out with a pattern. It's not as strongly plaid as some of my other colors are, and I think that's because this was not dyed consistently like my other ones are.
So, yeah. It's, like I said, it's not as strong, but you do kind of have, you know, like a pooling of the white yarns there and there, and some of the darker yarns here and here. And again, I'm sorry that the light is so bright, but if I don't have it on bright enough, it looks very, very dark and dingy. And I, I don't want anyone to be concerned that I'm living in a hole. <laughs> I think this is the, the only place I've managed to live in Britain that has so many beautiful windows. And yes, it's a bit of a double-edged sword right now because it is chilly in the house. <laughs> um, looks like uh, Debbie has uh, been sitting and listening, uh, knitting one sleeve of a sweater with only about two inches of body done so that I can avoid s sleeve island later, hopefully. <laughs> you know, I, I've i never done that with a sweater, but I can totally get what you're talking about uh, with the sleeves. I think every every pattern that I've ever followed that does sort of a top-down construction, like a raglan type increase for the sleeves, you always do those sleeves last. And I suppose it makes sense if you're knitting something for the first time, you want to see how the body of it fits, because the sleeves can be adjusted a little bit, um, but if there's stuff fundamentally wrong with the body, then all of the knitting that you've had to do on it will be for naught. <laughs> and then why why then did you do the sleeves? But if you've already done a sweater pattern or if it doesn't really matter to have like the body a particular way, then yeah, sleeves first. You think you're done and then you have to go back and do those dang sleeves. Would be good to see the weaving behind you being taken off the loom. Uh, oh, thank you, Jackie. I really like the colors too. I did not anticipate it having any yellow, but uh, when I made the same mistake with the blue, I did the same thing with the yellow. <laughs> uh, so I've got some really nice hand-painted yarns, but I also like semi-solids because they're great for bigger things like sweaters when you don't want a lot of busyness going on because you know, maybe you don't like a lot of contrasting colors, or, you, or you're worried about color pooling, which mine won't generally color pool like that. Um, or, you know, you, you want something really simple or understated so that the patterns that you're using can be more foregrounded, right? So you, you don't want something with a lot of color, or a lot of variety in the color, I guess. So, um, <clears throat> Because when I did the initial calculation for the amount of yardage I was going to need, um, it turned out like I was going to be about 600 yards shy. And I needed a way to incorporate some yarns that would look nice uh, in combination with the others. So I, I'm actually quite happy that I ended up using the yellows because it kind of brightens it a little bit without being um, sunny, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like it's not, it's not like a cheerful yellow, it's just kind of like, yeah, it's yellow, but more gold, maybe. Um, yeah, because the, the yarn that I've got on this right now is kind of like a, like autumn pinky yellow combo and uh, the red that I used, which I talked about the Gulf Coast native, I also used some pinks and, and, and browns in that so the yellow was really going to work well with um, the colors that I had uh, spun already. So um, it was kind of fortuitous that I could use my mistake yarn um, so conveniently because otherwise I was going to have to spin more yarn for it and I was not happy about that. Um, and if I didn't spin the yarn, if I went with hand dyed, I'd have to dye more yarn. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was kind of like a happy mistake. And it's going to be, uh, two panels. So 
it's 32 inches wide, my womb, but I wanted something that was kind of like a, a UK double, so that's about 60 inches when it's done. Uh, and I didn't want a square blanket, I wanted a rectangular blanket, so it's going to be roughly 60 by 75 inches. Um, because one of the things I hate is when a blanket is too short and you're basically fighting your upper half with your lower half because you want your feet covered but you also want to cramp up to your neck. <laughs> I am not a fan of the lap blanket. <laughs> if someone gave me a lap blanket, I would find a way to make it bigger. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so if... If I'm still, I mean, I'm probably still going to be weaving this because it's a five yard warp, which is the largest warp I've ever done um, on anything. A uh, little bit of challenge because I don't have any of those weaving slats, so the tension is a bit wonky. Uh, but I'm impatient and just went ahead with it. <laughs> I know what I need and I don't have it, but when I get the chance, I will buy a way to um, keep my warp nice and evenly spread and with a good amount of tension. So I need some weaving sticks. Um, I didn't really have anything I could use for it here. I suppose I could have used cardboard, but you need large pieces of cardboard uh, to fit along there. So, and I'd, I would just rather have the wood. It doesn't compress as much and my cat chews up cardboard like nobody's business. <laughs> Don't even know why. She's she's a rescue. <laughs> um, let's see here, what else? Um, yeah, so I, I will, de I mean, this is part of another project which I've not been able to announce yet because I've had COVID and it's sort of delayed my production schedule by a couple of weeks. So I won't be able to do as much for this project as I initially set out to do, but I will definitely film all of the stuff. Um, and in my daily vlog 60, which should be coming out probably next week, um, probably, probably mid to late next week uh, is when it'll come out. Um, I'll uh, show you how I took my Tour de Fleece project off the loom, but I will definitely share more video content of this project from start to finish. So there, we've got it taken off, and yes, <laughs> I've got a lot of extra yarn. <laughs> Goodness, oh, oh dear. That's fine, I'll just get rid of that. So here we've got, excuse me, uh, the finished square, like so. So yeah, accidental flad. <laughs> so we've done these two. This one was definite. This is this is how a semi-solid should look, by the way. So if you've heard me say semi-solid, or if you've seen semi-solid in text, this is usually what it means. It's not a hundred percent perfectly green. There's a little bit of variation in the color, which is nice, but it's not going to detract from any kind of uh, textured stitches, or in this case, weaving. But this one quite clearly has some patterning to it because the dye was not uh, done consistently. In this case, it was accidental, but I also do this on purpose. I just you know, forgot some basic dye rules. And then in terms of thickness, um, I don't know if you could really see this super well on the stream, but this one is much thicker than this one, and it's because this was a worsted yarn and this one is a sock yarn. Um, so we're talking about like two to three gauge difference, like knitting gauge difference between these two. So, um, you know, you could definitely use them both in the same project because they're both merino. This one's super washed, this one isn't. But once you've washed them, you can actually compare them to see how they are uh, lining up. And um, if you wanted to use them in the same project, you could actually do something where you've got 
thicker spots, or like thicker patches and thinner patches, just to kind of give a slightly different drape to a project, or um, you know, you can use them more strategically. Gosh, these would be great for kids, right? Because I just remember having patches on my clothes when I was little. Kids. <laughs> I was a bit rough on my clothing, and <laughs> my parents hated it. Um, so my mom, having all of the sewing knowledge, she would just sew my clothes back together. <laughs> but they would didn't they didn't look as nice as this? Because <laughs> um, once you've broken denim, it's kind of hard to make it look like it's not broken again. <laughs> yeah. Ta-da! Two great samples. Thank you, Jackie. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Tanya says that she uses paper bags or a roll of craft paper. That's basically what I ended up having to do. Um, so when we moved here, we still had a few things up on this bookshelf here that were wrapped up. And so I used that packing paper on it, but it doesn't, I, I mean, I can tell because on the edges, there's just too much, uh, warp when I first tied on the, uh, warp to the front bar. I know that that is that basically means that on the other end, those ends are going to be shorter. <laughs> and when it comes to actually the weaving process, the edges are looser than the middle, even though when I initially set it all up, it was fine. And it's because the end of the paper kind of slumps, and so I don't get as much tension. So I have to be really careful about how I deal with the edges so that I don't get um, a narrowing of my project. So, yeah, I mean, I'm n I've am i never really been in a position to just buy the exact thing that I need, but I always know that there is a thing that I need out there that exists. I just, you know, need to buy it whenever I can. <laughs> so, um, yeah, paper is working for now, but I know that uh, in the future I want to do more weaving projects. So I'm probably going to need to invest in something that gives me better tension when I'm weaving. Um, Tris has also suggested balsa wood or a lumber store with yardsticks. That's definitely another option. Um, I don't actually know where the nearest such store is to me because I live very rurally and it could be like an hour bus ride to go and see. And, and that's assuming I only have to take one bus to get there. <laughs> so I'm trying to get my driver's license here because I know how to drive in the States but not in the UK and uh, that's a big barrier to um, getting to a lot of places so I might just have to buy it online um, the visible mending embroidery sashiko trends uh, that Tanya has been seeing yeah I completely agree um, gosh I'm actually trying to think there's Katsuki, I'm going to say. It's a, a Japanese trend where you, um, like let's say something is slightly broken or cracked, you kind of fill that in in a beautiful way. So, I mean, kits, Kitsunuki? Yeah, it's, it's something like that. Because uh, I had a colleague who wrote a paper from a, an Iron Age perspective where people in the past would have done something similar. Uh, and we have loads of archaeological examples from metallurgy where people have taken like an object uh, and a bit of it has been broken and they sort of, they make a repair, but given what they must have known about repairs, it kind of looks shoddy. But it's not necessarily shoddy, it's kind of artistic in a way. So. They have made something that uh, was broken more visible by the manner in which they've repaired it. So it's not necessarily that they didn't know how, they just actively chose not to, and that's kind of like an artistic license on the whole repair idea. Um, and so, yeah, it's even being talked about within. Um, well, at least later prehistoric archaeology in the last few years. So, it's everywhere. <laughs> um, uh, four inch wide uh, basswood at Michael's, trimmed down, sanded. Um, 
Yeah, I need, yeah, I definitely need 32 inches. Because I've got, I decided to get the big one. <laughs> um, thank you so much for watching, Debbie, and sticking around. Oh my gosh, we're going to get dinner in the way. Luckily, we're having breakfast for dinner. I love that. Breakfast for dinner. <laughs> they just said, ain't nobody got time for that and just did the thing. <laughs> Yeah, um, people did really weird things with objects and sometimes the decisions to fix things in, in certain ways or not fix them uh, is really curious for us. So it tells us a lot about like what humans in the past might have been thinking about. Um, and by drawing on what people do today when confronted with similar problems is, is really fascinating because even though I would never say that humans today are exactly like humans of two and a half thousand years ago, um, I think that broadening out of the way we consider humans in the past is really important. Um, and it's one of the things I actively try to do, uh, getting kind of like a, the realm of possibility. Um, it's much more um, optimistic and it promotes um, a wider view or perspective of what people may have been doing and it can lead you to have very interesting discussions some of which um, like in this one here that seem to um, you know cross all sorts of boundaries we're talking about time differences you know the people in the past people now uh, academics versus you know general audience um, I don't expect anyone who watches my videos to be as up-to-date about later prehistoric British archaeology as me. <laughs> so, you know, the fact that we can have the discussion is really cool. Um, but yeah, what is 32 inches in millimeters? 800? 800 millimeters? 800 millimeters? Uh, I don't know if that sounds right. It might be. Because I know a centimeter is smaller than an inch. Could be. 800 millimeters. <laughs> It sounds it sounds weird. I don't know when you when you give big measurements in millimeters. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to wind down uh, the live stream today. I very much appreciate everyone joining me today and sticking around for so long and having uh, fun with me and asking lots of great questions. I will um, post when I'm going to do another live stream. I'm trying really hard to give everyone about a day's notice uh, at the very least. Um, and hopefully I'm not going to be sick anymore this year. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. I'm done with being ill. <laughs> no more broken bones. <laughs> um, and so we'll just continue making progress on fun things. And if you have any ideas for future live streams, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, when I do make the announcement for the next live stream, I will be putting in some kind of description or title so that you kind of get a sense of what we're going to be talking about. Um, and uh, in terms of video schedules, I'll get that up um, basically as often as I can. We'll try to set premieres uh, for around 8 o'clock when I do so that more people can be around to see them. Um, and again, trying to get give people sort of a heads up that this is imminent so that if you want to watch with us during the premiere um, you know you can kind of pencil that into your diary um, I will be getting back to putting more things in the shop the difficulty is I don't really have a lot of space and um, with broken foot and tendonitis and being sick and the holidays in general it's just it's been really difficult to kind of get to it <laughs> but I promise you I will um, and hopefully 2023 will be better than 2022 I'm, I'm very hopeful of that so anyway I hope you guys had a great time enjoy your Sunday and whatever else you might be doing later um, before you go please give me a thumbs up uh, subscribe if you haven't already uh, follow my social media if you want to stay up to date with goings on or at least with YouTube you can turn on notifications so that at least you know when I'm going to be live and when I have a video that's coming out um, yeah so anyway thank you so much 
Have a great Sunday. Bye.